Uh, thank you, Teresa, and, um, and thank you to everyone here for the invitation to be part of this. Um, what I'm going to do is um, briefly set up the panel, um, and this means two things. First, uh, I'm going to sketch a bit of Godard's career and work after 1968. Um, second, I'll introduce our panelists, and we'll all come up here and talk for a while. Um, We'll then open it up to questions at the end, but um, I assume you know how that works, um, or at least can figure it out fairly quickly. So what does it mean to talk about post-1968 Godard, post-68 Godard? For many of us, certainly myself included, one of the ways we came into film studies, one of the ways we became interested in film was through Godard's work of the 1960s. Breathless, Contempt, Band of Outsiders, Viva Sa Vie, Two or three things I know about her, um, Pierre Le Fou. These are the great films of cinephilic love. They're the films that made us want to think more about film. 1968 seems to change that. Partially this is due to historical events, the May 1968 uprising, um, general strike in France and its subsequent failure. And Godard's films respond to this. His film Weekend made that year in 1968 ends with the title, End of Cinema, as if he had brought cinema to a close, or as if there was nothing for, left for him to do, or, as it turned out, as if he needed to start doing something else, some new kind of cinema. He may have said, End of Cinema. What he meant was, I need to continue cinema in a new way. His next film, Le Gay Savoir, would start, as he said, from zero, and build up an entirely new, audiovisual language, one that was free from the influence of the culture, one that could provide a new foundation for a new cinema. And over the past now 46 years, Godard has continued to make films, videos, television shows, commercials. He's made them, well, not quite at the astonishing clip of the early 1960s, but still at an impressive rate. In fact, his newest film, uh, Adieu au Langage, released this year, is also in 3D. This period, well not a period, it's an entire career, post-68. Not, it's not one unified subject, even though we're covering it in a single panel. It's made up of a number of episodes, a number of starts and restarts, a number of provisional ends, a number of new beginnings. Immediately after 1968, Godard founds the Giga Vertov group with Jean-Pierre Gorin, a collaboration, making radical films with the ambition of continuing the project, the political project, the cinematic project of the 1968 generation. A series of events ranging from a motorcycle to the dissolution of this collaboration forces a change. He moves to Switzerland. He begins a new collaboration with Henri Mieville, his partner, and co-author on a number of films, hers and his. And these films in the 1970s shift their own interest. They move more towards video. They take up questions about the home as well as, as, well as the political sphere, about here as well as elsewhere, his title of a 1973 film. More generally, they begin to investigate his place, his own place of the self, of the filmmaker in the creation of these films. Not, just, not quite for the first time, but for the first time, a systematic analysis of Godard's own role in the creation of images as he's making them. Another change seems to happen at the end of the 1970s. For the first time in more than a decade, Godard returns to feature filmmaking with the film Sauve qui peut la vie, which will be shown later tonight. And the 1980s witness a flourishing, a renewed return to feature filmmaking and films that are notable for their sensuous beauty, their interest in natural landscapes, their use of and reference to high art, from literature to music to painting. The 1990s see another interest emerging, an interest, it seems, in the history of the 20th century and the history of cinema. Now, this is not a new interest for Godard. From the very beginning, 
the very beginning all the way back to Breathless, the history of cinema has played a role in his work. And starting in the 1970s, Godard began to think more explicitly about what it was to write or to make, to film a history of cinema. As I think both Jonathan and Nicole will talk about later on, um, his connection with the founder of the French Cinémathèque, Henri Langlois, is central to this. And in the mid-1970s, Langlois was unable to fulfill obligations to give a series of lectures in Montreal. Godard stepped in, showed his films alongside films from the histories of cinema, gave, gave a series of lectures along with them, and titled them The Introduction to a History of Cinema. This book has recently been uh, really, for the first time in several decades, uh, published uh, in an English translation. In the early 1990s, this interest, though, shows up in a new form. He begins incorporating, taking, incorporating clips from and of the history of cinema and the history of 20th century directly into his work. It's in, for example, his early 1990s film, Germany, year 90, 90, where for the first time we begin to get a sense of what will become a characteristic style of Godard's later works, a stuttering of video playback, images that start, stop, rush forward, the grain of the video felt on the screen as we're watching it. While a number of short films, short videos, uh, take up this concern, the major work that does so is his probably masterpiece, uh, Histoire du Cinema, released in various stages from 1988 to 1998, though not on DVD, eventually until about 10 years later. Histoire du Cinema takes up the history of cinema. It takes up the history of the 20th century, and it takes up a series of accounts of how these histories or stories, as Godard will play on the word, intersected, how they influenced, or perhaps could have influenced, one another. Godard tracks the possibilities, Godard tracks the failures, the connections, the misconnections. All this is done through a dazzling and spellbinding montage of clips, through a series of associations, through a vast array of references to the history of literature and art, and through a range of arguments that emerge, go away again, come back in an altered form, and run throughout the eight episodes of the series. Since its completion in 1998, Godard has returned to making films, or has continued to make films, releasing a series of feature films. He's also continued to make videos, from a commission for the Museum of Modern Art in New York to a private video, a personal tribute to the deceased, recently deceased Eric Romer. In this vast array of work, there is no single theme, single argument, single topic that preoccupates Godard. There is no one style he subscribes to. Indeed, perhaps the hallmark of Godard's career is the mutability and flexibility of his work, its adaptation and adaptability to changing circumstances, changing interests, whether these are historical, film historical, or technological. What happens as we follow Godard's career is that we see a set of interests remaining the same, but the form they take begins to change. His politics, for example, continues. Not in the same way. What would it mean to continue a 1968 model of politics through the 1970s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, early 2010s? Instead, there becomes something of a shift. Godard becomes interested, let's say, in trying to understand the world, not change it, or understand the world, perhaps in order later to change it. He turns to history, and at the same time, he turns, to, he turns to a broader social shift that's happening in the culture around him, a movement away from the energies of revolution 
and towards the melancholy of retreat. His concern with technologies also runs through these works. Godard has always been engaged with the up-to-date, the technologically up-to-date. He's, he's innovated within technology. This goes back again to Breathless, where Raoul Coutard stitched together 35 millimeter uh, photographic reels in order to create the proper um, celluloid for the film. It continues through his own homemade video technology, at once up-to-date and able to look um, able to look outdated at the same time. And he's turned to 3D in recent films as well, not simply adapting the process itself, but transforming it, making it his own. Running through these, or even in video, one of his famous remarks, um, where he said, cinema and video, Cain and Abel. But in that analogy, match cinema to Cain and video to Abel not necessarily the technological gloom, but an understanding of the stakes involved. Running through these concerns and topics, perhaps most explicitly emerging around the return to feature filmmaking in 1979, but even so throughout much of the post-weekend films, is a new interest in aesthetics, or a new concern, more explicit concern in aesthetics. On the one hand, this means an interest in beauty, in natural beauty, in human beauty, but also in the beauty that's involved in the framing, the act of creating an image on screen, a picture. It also comes up in the increasing importance of the idea of judgment, that the things which connect various images to one another are not an internal logic, a structure given in advance and known before, before the actual enactment, but rather a discernment of affinities, a recognition of possibilities, and an act of judgment on his part. One, we're at liberty to judge ourselves. An act of judgment on his part that brings elements together or fails to do so. There's no authority outside his own. In these late works, especially since Histoire du Cinema, we see him sitting at an editing table putting together aspects of history, creating it for himself and for us. What stands out in Godard's work after 1968, again, is the sheer inventiveness, the sheer richness of the work. Its power in all its various forms, media, and concerns. What's begun to happen over the past few years, is for the first time a serious interest has begun to, to coalesce around these, these films. A number of books have come out, a number of articles. There's an attempt to account for, to understand, to make sense of, or at least to try and explain how and why these films reach us as they do. In many ways, this panel is an example of that renewed interest. This collection of exemplary scholars that will be discussing Godard's late work for the next 45 or 50 minutes. So it gives you great pleasure to be able to introduce the members of the panel who will be able to talk briefly for a while about their own interest in, in these films and then hold a discussion amongst them, to be able to work through some of the problems that Godard's films and videos pose, but also the possibilities they afford. So I suppose you guys should come up. <laughs> so we have three people here who form the base of the panel. Nicole Bernays, who teaches cinema studies at the University of Paris III Sorbonne Nouvelle, as the curator of the Cinémathèque Française's avant-garde film series. She's written extensively on Godard and other aspects of French cinema um, and has curated series and films across the world. Murray Pomerantz is a professor in the Department of Sociology and director of the Media Studies Working Group at Ryerson University 
and Murray has written a range of books on topics that move from narrative and experience to Michelangelo and Tony, to Johnny Depp, to Alfred Hitchcock. Jonathan Rosenbaum, the former film critic for the Chicago Reader, is one of the foremost writers on film, narrative, experimental, anything that moves, <laughs> for, the, for several decades, for a number of decades. His books include Moving Places, Placing Movies, Discovering Orson Welles, Goodbye Cinema, Hello Cinephilia, and he's written extensively over the years on Godard's films, tracking their changes and developments as Godard's own work has changed and developed. So please join me in welcoming them to the stage as well. So, Jonathan, would you like to kick us off? Okay, I'll, I'll see what I can do. Um, I've been fascinated lately with the, I guess, the, the phenomenon of the fact that Godard is someone who continues not just to upset people, but some people, but to enrage them. Um, and I find that there are interesting parallels between the fact that in the way that he does this and uh, the way that Orson Welles continues to do this. Um, I just wanted to trace a few parallels, which I think are interesting. First, that um, many of the people who are most enraged by these two people persist in misspelling their names. <laughs> um, there's an, a kind of a fantasy that people have regarding both filmmakers that they would love to be able to kind of collect them all the way they collect, I don't know, Charles Dickens or, you know, or Woody Allen or, I mean, having them all those titles on a shelf and having it all containable and they want closure and they're never going to get it. And this is part of, I think, what enrages them. Um, you're never going to have all of Orson Welles up on a shelf. You're never going to have all of Jean-Luc Godard up on a shelf. There's also an interesting thing that confuses people uh, regarding both filmmakers, which is what one does and how one factors in their major collaborators, Henri Mayville in the case of Godard, Oya Kodar in the case of late Orson Welles. I mean, these were like people who are major collaborators outside of cinema, who people don't really know how to deal with in relationship to the rest of the work, even though there's a very interesting book that came out recently in Canada by Jerry White called Do Bicycles, which really tries to address the question of how are Godard's films with Anne-Marie Mayville different from the others, and which is a very interesting question. But I think the point is, is that I think people, what they want from Godard and what they're not, they've never been able to get is a sense of, um, being able to seize him, being able to hold him, being able to process him, when in fact, Godard is always processing us, we're not processing him. And I think that it, because it's a process that's open-ended, that's the, what, what I think frustrates some people about trying to come to terms with his work. I tend to see um, certain kinds of continuity, almost more than discontinuity, between early Godard and late Godard. Um, namely the fact that he was always a person who was a film critic who also made films and who saw them as two sides of the same activity. I think that's a kind of continuity that w continues up into the present. But I also think that one thing that's very important and that Nicole I think is also going to discuss is that I think the major artistic influence on Godard and, and on his entire career greater in, um, as an influence than that of André Malraux or of André Bazin or of all the other people who are seen as major influences on Godard is Henri Langlois. Now, of course, Langlois was a programmer, not a filmmaker. But what he did, which I think was the act that created the sensibility of the new wave more than any other, was to program films from all of the history of cinema in juxtaposition with one another, day after day. 
So that in a very strange sort of way, for the first time, these films became suddenly set up to be in dialogue with one another. So that you almost had, through this kind of almost haphazard, sometimes chance programming of juxtapositions, you know, Kinsey Mizuguchi in conversation with Otto Preminger and D.W. Griffith in conversation with Eisenstein in, you know, in exchange with Howard Hawks and so on. It seems to me that those juxtapositions are very important even in the, the kind idea, the multi-textual aspects of Godard, the idea of putting everything into a film. Because Langlois also was opening up the history of cinema to the history of art very much and seeing those two things as part of the same process. And certainly it seems to me the one of the best accounts of where histoire de cinema comes from is to go to Langlois' own programming practices. I, one thing I remember, which is very emblematic of um, the confusion and the craziness of Langlois, is that when he traveled around the world, he used to collect coins of various denominations in this huge sack. And when it came time to pay his staff, he would just simply reach into the sack and pull out, you know, yen or francs or dollars or whatever happened to be in his hand and pay the staff and, and you know, random handfuls. Uh, it seems to me that that kind of uh, radical gesture is very key to what Langlois did to change our perceptions of cinema, uh, which is still very much with us and which is still what I think part of Godard's enterprise is up to. So I think that's all I have to say for now. Well, thank you, Jeff. Let's just move down the row. Um, Nicole? Oh, je vais mettre... Um, bonjour, hello. Um, I will make a um, raccord <laughs> with just what you said, because Longlois made something else, um, another kind of gesture, very beautiful and innovative too. When he, when he, each time he went to a new country, like, for example, Turkey or Greece, or he came and gave to the people in charge of the future Cinematheque the films that the Frères Lumière, the Lumière brothers, made at the beginning of the century. So he, he gave to people their, the image of their past, thanks to the Frères Lumière. And I think it's uh, also a very Godardian uh, way of considering the importance of cinema. It's to, of course, he said often uh, to send news from you uh, through the images, but it also to to give uh, to offer someone his own images. And um, um, another, of course, uh, important dimension of this, um, in a way, uh, co-creation between Langlois and Godard, because I think it's a very dual uh, relationship, is of course piracy. <laughs> I mean. <laughs> There were both pirates, and uh, Godard still is. He said always, uh, uh, when someone asked him uh, for his rights to screen a film or to show a film, the film that hasn't been bo uh, bought by uh, Gaumont, of course, he always say, you don't have any rights to pay. You only have the duty to show. Uh, voilà. And uh, of course, uh, there is all this problem of uh, copyrights um, that the Histoire du Cinéma uh, raised and to acquire, to buy the rights of uh, many of the, the pictures or excerpts he used in the Histoire du Cinéma. Uh, he sold the rights of his films <laughs> and he sold especially the rights of the Ziga Virtuf, Virtuf films uh, period and he didn't have the rights. <laughs> Well, uh, that's an endless story about uh, who, to whom an image uh, uh, belongs. And for Godard, it, it didn't, it don't, an image doesn't belong to him or to the one who, who does it, but very likely to the people who can have a use, an, an, an utility, uh, who can use it in a new way, in a revolutionary way. And then we have to discuss what is a revolution. But, <laughs> but uh, voila, 
pra the piracy is, is so very important. And um, so that was to answer to your beautiful uh, anecdote about the bag of money. But uh, another very important thing, uh, very structuring about uh, the relationship between Langlois and Godard, is that uh, very early Langlois was a critic of Godard. He defended the work of Godard. Very early Godard wa works were screened into the screen of the Cinémathèque uh, where he learned cinema, he learned the love of cinema. And very early in uh, uh, Godard, uh, Langlois wrote about Godard and later in 76, he made a series, it was um, after the Montreal uh, series that uh, Daniel was uh, uh, speaking of, he made a series, an uh, audiovisual series titled Les Anticours, the anti-classes, the anti-seminars about cinema. And one of the episodes, one of the issues, was about a comparison between Andy Warhol and Jean-Luc Godard. And so it was very, a very beautiful uh, idea. It, it was the first, I think, to really draw this comparison systematically. And the point uh, of articulation between the two was that they were able to invent forms of the sketch, of the draft, uh, meaning to achieve non-perfection. And of course, it's uh, not to be imperfect, like the imperfect cinema of the third world uh, liberation cinema, but it's um, the idea or the desire or the ideal to be faithful to the gesture of creativity and to be able to connect directly the, the final images, so the, the image one can see uh, and one can share and one can one offer or steal <laughs> also, to connect this uh, objective image, this uh, material image, to the desire to, from which she, it, it came. And the draft uh, is one of the main uh, formal uh, chantier work uh, of Godard during this uh, late period, during all his life, but especially during the period we, we are talking about. And to not to be too long and uh, give the, to transmit the talk to, to Murray. Um, I would just add that uh, that's also one of the reasons uh, why Godard is so important, uh, because otherwise we won't be here. Um, it's because for me, but I think for many filmmakers also, and for many people, is a model of freedom. Um, formal freedom, of course, uh, freedom about uh, all the gesture concer concerning art in, in general, not, not only cinema, but art in general, and freedom about every gesture, every living uh, gesture. And uh, I could compare him uh, only to another uh, great artist of the last two centuries, uh, a comparison that of course, is based on a dissimilarity, uh, is Jonas Mikas. Because, uh, in a way, they both invented two models of counter-industries. Uh, they both invented a way to create every day. And that's why Jonathan also is so right to say that uh, we, we can't have all Godard sh in a shelf, because he's, m he's making daily exercise in his own... Uh, Little uh, fabric, non, sa petite usine. Uh, how do you say usine en, en anglais? Um, factory. factory. Merci. Bah oui, évidemment, c'est comme Varol. <laughs> in, in his own little uh, factory in Hall, he is making films and he edits films absolutely every day. And we don't have all the sketches. We what what you you are seeing during this magnificent uh, retrospective of the late Godard is some of the films uh, that he. Uh, allows to go out and to be public, but every day he's making exercises. And uh, the problem is that also he's throwing away everything. Uh, so uh, there's a lot uh, of Godard works that will be uh, lost forever. So, voilà. And, and voilà. The, the model, two models of freedom, just 
Godard being totally individualistic in a way, no one can reproduce uh, his the Godard Godardian model of factory. And of course, Jonas is exactly the opposite. It's the collective model that has been reproduced all over the world um, and giving birth to many, many wonderful uh, filmmakers and artists. Murray. Um, I come at this from a slightly different point of view, I guess, um, or from a different, maybe, camera position. I, uh, <laughs> watching Godard, I'm rather struck by certain continuing movements which involve um, ideas, non-ideas, sounds, images, uh, image manipulations, uh, bodies, temporalities, and um, urgencies of various kinds. Um, and I really wanted to um, react with you today w with a couple of these that have really struck me. There are a couple of ideas. Uh, I have no idea how to um, say them all in five or six minutes at all, except uh, this is the kind of thing Godard would love doing. Uh, I just can't imagine how I'm going to do it. Uh, in Nouvelle Vague, there's a r remarkable long sequence of uh, grieving, which takes place in a gorgeous country estate by a lake, uh, with a character who's known in the film as the Contessa Torlato Fabrini. Um, she, um, she gets into a boat with her lover friend, Alain Delon, and they go out into the water, and uh, she encourages him to come for a swim. She goes in and starts swimming. Come on in, come on in, come on in. He says, I can't swim, can't swim. Come on in, can't swim. Come on in, can't swim. Come on in, can't swim. Give me your hand. She pulls him in the water. He drowns. And she watches. So the watching of the drowning, of course, is um, leave her to heaven, John M. Stahl, 1946. Uh, almost a steal. And uh, the 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 husband, wife, or lover, or you know, male female protagonists caught up in the lake mortally in a boat is uh, Murnau's Sunrise, um, and he's bringing all of this, but but subtly and latently, and through it all, um, we're watching the slow closure of the great Torlato Fabrini estate. Uh, everybody's leaving, so it's a little bit of Chekhov's The Cherry Orchard. And, th and we're hearing very provocative music. He's, he's really, I've got, nobody really talks a lot about this. He's overwhelming as a music director. I mean, his ways of using a snatch of music to score a shot are unsurpassed, except, well, I mean, I find things in Hitchcock, but I always leave Hitchcock on the side. Um, it's really amazing. Um, in Passion, there's a shot of an airplane flying way up 30,000 feet across the sky, and he's using a clip from the beginning of the Ravel um, D minor um, piano concerto for the left hand only, which is a very powerful work that was written for the pianist Paul Wittgenstein. Uh, um, blank out in front of an audience. It's always the best place to do it. Ludwig Wittgenstein's, <laughs> I looked at your face, I got Ludwig, Ludwig Wittgenstein's brother, who, who lost his arm in the First World War, and so he wanted people to write concerti for him, and Ravel wrote this fantastic concerto for the left hand, and we hear it. And we see this plane kind of arching over. It's just extremely chilling. So in the same way that that's chilling, uh, we have here in Nouvelle Vague, um, Hindemith's Die Trauermusik, um, which is mourn a mournful dirge for full orchestra, and a long excerpt from the a slow movement in the middle of Matister Mahler, um, the entombment. So there's this sense of grief and grieving, and we're grieving not only for this character, this body, but for the world, for the for the for the world of the rich, which is slowly falling apart. And uh, later, uh, there's a kind of flip where uh, an identical twin uh, shows up and takes uh, the Contessa out in the boat and drowns her, and then it turns out she's not really drowned, so, you know, life, death, the whole. 
antithesis that we can imagine playing out. At any rate, while this is on the screen, I keep resonating every time someone talks about the Contessa Torlato Fabrini and what the Torlato Fabrinis are gonna do and the cars keep driving in and out of the estate with Torlato Fabrini written on some of the door. And they keep talking Torlato Fabrini and I keep thinking, damn it, I've heard this somewhere before. And of course it is, the Contessa Torlato Fabrini is the unbelievably existing daughter of the Count Torlato Fabrini from the Barefoot Contessa from 1954, Joe Mankiewicz's film. Joe Mankiewicz wanted uh, a James Mason homosexual count who marries, takes the Barefoot Contessa Eva Gardner as his wife and then she discovers on the wedding night that he's gay, but the censors wouldn't let him do it. So in anger, you know, he just had to write all kinds of, you know, in the war he had an injury that got in the way of him culminating the marriage and all kinds of nonsense. And the bottom line is that the Torlato Fabrinis, uh, the Count Rosano Brasi and his sister Valentino Cortese can't have children, there will be no more. And when they see Eva Gardner in the, in the surf coming out of the water, he looks at the sister and says, the last Contessa. And of course, Godard says, no, 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 no. And he brings back a new Contessa Torlato Fabrini, brings her back to life, revivifies cinema. So there's this fantastic ability to, to engage with the temporality and history of cinema through one's love of film by bringing the dead back. Godard, of course, was somewhat obsessed by Jean Cocteau's comment that in film, we actually see death at work because we're watching the characters aging as we're watching the film on spool. I mean, no matter what's happening dramatically in the film, everybody in the film gets older as you watch it because you're getting older. So there's that fantastic idea. And the, I guess the, I've only got time for one more thing. So the other thing that has been obsessing me beside this historical trip that he's taking is an idea that recurs in a lot of his recent films about the forest. In the most recent film, he actually has a line where uh, a character tells another one that the Indians say they call the world a forest. They use the word forest to describe the world. Fantastic, but the idea of the forest has come up in many of his films since the 80s onward. The forest as a kind of metaphor for a, 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 a totally encircling um, zone of a, a contemporaneous and distracting images and sounds that are all present. You have the feeling with recent Godard that everything is there all at once. So for instance, to follow, in film socialism, to try to follow any conversation is just hopeless. There's voices all around and you don't know who's talking and the voices are either talking to one another or to themselves or whatever. And all of it's coming at you. This sense of being surrounded by such a rich, array of textures and um, textures and colors and forms and tones and, and anxieties and feelings, all of it uh, necessarily disconnected and yet all of it one because it's one experience. So I, mean, I so much resonate with um, Jonathan's earlier comment that it might be somewhat difficult to talk about the difference between early and late Godard, because there is one Godard, he is one person, but he's getting older. And so as a person who's getting older, he's got more of a sense of, of time. And I think also more of a sense of the value of all things once one attends to them. So there's the value of attention and a lot of um, comments in the films directing us about the way we should be attending to things and to cinema itself. Maybe that's enough for now. Thank you, all three. Um, one thing that strikes me running through these these discussions, um, and that in some ways is touched on each, is this idea of not stopping. Um, the sketch, the unfinished work, um, the reading into the history of film. Um, right, That there's somehow all of Godard's work is defined by, or is marked by, an absence of ends. Um, of coming to an end. Um, it's true of the way the films hang together. It's true of the way Godard reads the history of cinema. It's true even in some sense with, you know, within each film. 
it also seems to be to be true of and a problem for thinking about Godard. Um, as Murray's um, discussion of Nouvelle Vague shows, you can go down the rabbit hole very quickly. Um, he mentioned in, in passion the moment of the concerto for the left hand, Ravel's concerto, for, for um, Ludwig Wittgenstein's brother. Does that mean that we should connect that moment? Is that an allusion to Wittgenstein's own work? Wittgenstein will become more important for Godard over the 1990s, in particular the, the short text on certainty, which becomes, is quoted, is displayed for us. Um, Godard takes the book out, recites its title, um, reads a passage, puts it away, uh, actually usually then goes to Diderot. Um, is that moment, early moment an anticipation of it? Is it something else? Um, should we keep going back into the history of music? Should we keep going back into the history of cinema? When we're talking about Godard, it seems that at certain moments, where do we stop? Um, how do we, do we need to become masters, you know, or or uh, masterful dilettantes um, through the history of culture in the way that he is to understand them? Well, one thing that's a very teasing game that he plays with us is that, you know, his of cinema is sort of like, so everybody says it's predicated on cinemas at an end, the centuries at an end, you know, everything is ending. But his of cinema hasn't ended yet. It's like there have been so many postscripts to it in terms of subsequent films and things that are, and videos that have come afterwards. And in fact, all of his work since then has been an addenda to Histoire de Cinema. So Histoire de Cinema has not ended. The history of cinema may have ended in Godard's mind, but Godard's history of the history of cinema is going on forever. So it seems to me that that's one of the paradoxes he's dealing with, because I think part of the idea, and I think another thing we could see as part of his thought patterns that go back a long way is the fact that he's an Hegelian. And the fact that every thesis has an antithesis. So it's not like um, it, waiting for, you know, to have Godard on a shelf is like waiting for the final synthesis. It's not a synthesis that's ever going to come because every time he gets a new thesis, there's a new antithesis. And in terms of the way his mind develops and sort of setting something up. So the history in Godard is not something that we can ever find. We can only uh, make it. I and mean, when it's something that he, it's something to be made, not something to be found. Um, I would add that um, the theme of the days and ends of uh, the cinema, the history, the humanity, everything, the century, of course, um, are like um, motifs, you know. Um, but the practice, I mean, the gesture, the creative gesture, are exactly the opposite. Um, in the sense of the histoire du cinéma and all Godard history and the allegory that Murray gave us, offered us, thanks to the Contest Torlato Fabrini, is, is really, really useful. Um, the purpose is the contrary of the this thematic of the end. Um, it's on the contrary to transmit, to transfer all the ideals, corpus, uh, pictures, uh, um, horizon uh, of the cinema into other arts. And uh, one of the very effective gestures of Godard, of the late Godard, is to transfer on every technology, on every tool, uh, all this visual culture and uh, this visual and uh, sound culture uh, that uh, cinema of the classical cinema offered to the history of the arts. And so, um, in a way, is, as Murray said, re re uh, revivifying, re -refying, transmitting. In the process of transfer, of course, there is a new creation. Uh, there is similitude and dissimilitude. And um, it's exactly the contrary of melancholy. Um, I mean, all the thematic are very me melancholic, and all the practices are on 
super energetic <laughs> and innovative and dynamic and uh, uh, that's a paradox, a very fruit fruitful paradox that also structures uh, Godard works. There's a, there's a line I've always liked um, of uh, Thomas Mann writing about Theodore Fontaine and saying that toward the end of his life, Fontaine is tired, he's all washed up, he's, he's, he's no longer has energy, he only has 18 more novels left in him, <laughs> each one better than the last. Well, in the spirit of talking about being washed up, um, that particular word, um, because you know Godard's obsessed with words and uh, taking them apart. So washed up is perfect. Y y it's synchronous that you just said that at this moment. Um, and Nicole's earlier uh, very um, s uh, evocative uh, comment about um, Lanois delivering the Lumiere to the world in a way. Um, I, I'm, I'm reminded of a couple of moments in um, film socialism, a film that uh, takes place at the beginning very largely on a large ocean liner sailing the Mediterranean, which stops at the various uh, havens of our culture. It stops in Greece, it stops in Alexandria, it stops in Napoli. I think it stops in Barcelona. It goes around and it makes you know a, a number of key stops, but it's full of uh, really ugly, um, stupid tourists having a, an ugly, stupid time. But of course, Godard makes it very colorful, colorful but simultaneously vacuous. Uh, manages to show the vacuity, indeed, through the intensity of the color. It's a fantastic uh, achievement, but. As this film, as this boat stops, it makes stops the way Langlois made stops. Um, it, it gets washed up, as it were. There are two shots in the film that are, really strike me as being a little bit about this idea um, of Godard understanding an end of cinema or an end of a voyage or coming to an end. In both of the shots, they're both identical shots in a way, constructively, but different to look at. One takes place in Alexandria, the other one's in Napoli. The boat has docked for a little while. I guess th these people want to go for a walk or shop or something. So we get a shot, a long shot, made from some location in the city, looking out toward the port, and we see the city spreading before us in Alexandria and in Napoli, we actually see a couple of rows of apartment buildings going down a street. And at the end of the block in the Napoli shot is the yacht, the boat. And in uh, Alexandria, it's much further off, but it's docked at one of the piers. So you see this gleaming white boat. By incredible circumstance, the boat is the Costa Concordia, uh, a year and a half before it capsizes. But of course, nobody knew that at the time. So there it is, gleaming white, pure, and always on the move. Uh, in, the, in the new film, he brings our attention to the fact that the uh, Arabic uh, language use, someone offers someone a kirsch, uh, is that or is it in film socialism? Might be in film socialism. Someone offers somebody a kirsch, you know, kirschwasser, a drink, cherry liquor, and uh, the narrator notes that uh, the Arabs use the word kirsch to mean shark. So it's fascinating the idea of the boat as a kind of shark that never stops moving. It's just momentarily docked, but then it's going out again. This continually roving thing. But here we see it at the end of the block, as it were. You know, I think that the Napoli shot is an homage to Marnie. Now that I think of it, uh, he 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 was fascinated by uh, what so many of us who care about Hitchcock are with the the boat at the end of the street business that every you know the idiots are all, always complaining about. And here he he actually puts the boat at the end of the street. But again, that you know the boat is always going, but right now it isn't going anywhere. You know, so what is it to be going or not to be going is all, is itself itself an issue that he takes up. It's not clear cut. Nothing's clear cut. Everything's dialectical, including that. See, I think all of our questions and comments actually feed into Godard and come out of Godard again. I, I'm sure you think that too. Yeah, no, I, I just want to add a little detail about the end, because I think as the credits, uh, Godard had invented many, many extremely strong uh, forms of ends. And one of the most classical uh, is the story of cinema because at the end, at the end you have this uh, white rose uh, with the signature who signify Godard himself with like an auto portrait and the white rose. Uh, so it's a, it's a simple picture of a beautiful white rose, 
and this white rose, it refers to the, vi the Weisse Rose, uh, the German uh, movement, who was a movement um, created by two very young students, uh, German students, who were resistant against Hitler and uh, who would show uh, tracts upon a, a university and who finally were arrested and uh, beheaded. Uh, so it, it was one of this uh, rare moment of history where uh, young people saved the dignity of a whole people uh, who elected Hitler. And so um, Daniel mentioned Allemagne 90, Germany Year Zero, and this shot of the white, white rose is already here, refer to the device rose, so the resistant movement, and he used the same shot as being the, sign the visual signature of Godard at the end of the history of cinema, which is, it's so difficult to, to invent a head, an, an, an end for such a fresco about uh, all the sound and all the images, not only of cinema, but of art, uh, because there is as many paintings as excerpts of films. But at the end, there is this rose that means, of course, resistance, sacrifice, use, uh, hope, uh, courage, and uh, so that's a lesson, and that's a, a the reason. Re the reference, though, is, 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 and this is where the, the rabbit hole begins, or keeps going, the reference is slightly more complicated in Germany, year 99-0, is that, that the discussion of the White Rose Resistance Movement comes um, in a car shop, in a, in a place where two young people are buying cars, in the midst of a discussion of the Enlightenment, as one of them reaches up to the car light, clicks it on, and tells the other, this way the light always stays on. <laughs> so we have, again, even in, the, even in these late films, the worry about commodity culture, the idea of an automatic enlightenment um, running through. Um, Jonathan, was it? But I think one, thing, one thing I'd like to come back to is this idea that a number of us have brought up of Godard never giving up his role as a film critic. Um, that the films are equivalent to forms of criticism. That to make a film is to be a critic in that. One of the, the things that seems to me of why Histoire du Cinema has become prominent or popular is also connected to the rise and the increase of video essays and a kind of essay videographic criticism. Um, so I wonder if we can talk a bit about the kind of uh, video based rather than because I think it is it does matter that it's not that East Wadi cinema is not itself cinema that it's a work of video um, but how the kind of role of video based criticism of cinema works in Godard well I that came up when I interviewed Godard in uh, here in Toronto at the time of um, forever Mozart when he was here at the film festival and he said that he thought actually that the one thing video should be used for was criticism. In other words, he saw that very specific, in a very specific way. And of course, it's the idea that you, um, you could say that in a certain way, his early films are film criticism in the language of the media, in film. But when you have it from video, it obviously changes because it's a kind of, a, it's a distanciation from the medium itself. Mm -hmm. And um, it also seems to me that one of the things that's complicated in his work is the desire but the inability to tell stories. I mean, I think in other words, he would like to be part of that. What's for many people, what the whole history of cinema is nothing but uh, fiction films in 35 millimeter with movie stars. And Godard's, cinema occasionally comes close and brushes against that, but whatever quite, you know, making the leap. I guess the closest he comes maybe is not even breathless, but uh, contempt. Uh, but nonetheless, it's very, um, when he's shifting to video, it becomes much more, you could even say a kind of um, exploratory, exploratory tool because of the fact that the video is also cheaper, but it's also something 
that he can operate war with his own hands. And uh, it seems to be for that reason that, uh, that it's a continuing thing. But one of the things that I find curious about his work, I mean, you've written about this in late Godard, that in some ways, his to artist cinema, when he's dealing with Hitchcock, is a further development and even possibly a critique of what he wrote originally about Hitchcock. But at the same time, it's almost as if what he felt he originally wrote is written in stone. He's not in the least bit uh, willing to, in any overt way, to challenge things that he er originally wrote, which puts him in a whole different category from someone like Rivette, because Rivette refuses to publish his criticism in, in French because he disagrees with the things that he originally wrote. <laughs> Because, you know, he said bad things about Kurosawa, and now he likes Kurosawa, and things like this. Whereas with Godard, it seems like he, he really sees his own writing as part of history, and he's not about to go back and revise any of it. So it's a, it's a very funny kind of paradox, because on the one hand, what he's making out of that work is something quite different, and yet he doesn't want to go back and revise it. Well, it's, it, it's also connected in that way to his own sense that if there is a history of cinema, he is centrally a part of it. Yeah. Of course, of course, in um, Contempt, he gives some prominence to a shot of Coutard sitting on the uh, Mitchell 35 camera. Um, and in, in that way, not only acknowledges the contribution of Coutard to his work, but focuses on that camera, the complexity of it as a machine, its bulk, its weight, its the difficulty of maneuvering the camera around. And I think by the time he got to making Pes um, Weekend, <clears throat> Godard was already in the pre-video mode working to figure out how to get a camera that would be uh, easier to work with, lighter to work with. And he was you know, very, very instrumental in the development of the Aton, which is a 35 millimeter sound recording camera that is sort of like what we would use now as a video camera, a light video camera. Very lightweight, easy for one person to carry around. So even before his video work, he had a very uh, hands-on approach to his uh, work. I, I think it's, I think it's um, the transformation of society into the state that he is criticizing um, as a critic, that he's being a critic of much more than of film or of any medium or of the work of any you know, artist. And I know it, at one point he actually said, um, I think this is also in film socialism, but he also said that the critic is, is the guy who's gone over to the other team. So I think he, I think he made a transition. He, he really uh, came into a state where he knew that to, to be an artist, to make a film was to make, which isn't the same thing as to stand outside of and to appraise. To make has its own inherent problems. Um, I think one of the specificity of the late Godard, um, and there is more continuity, of course, uh, all along his work than discontinuity, but one of the specificity is precisely the invention of many, many uh, forms of visual critique. Um, and the result is all this. I mean, all around the fabulous uh, fresco, the Histoire du Cinéma, is all the short little essays, uh, video, that are exactly like uh, poetry, um, visual poetry and sound poetry. Um, for example, in France, we had to invent, at the end of the uh, 19th century, beginning of the 20s, the idea of uh, poesy en prose, uh, poetry in prose, to be able to characterize uh, the new forms of poetry. And we have to invent new words for the kind of visual poetry that uh, Godard had invented uh, in his last work. And I think Antoine, Antoine de Beck, uh, will have a special screening of um, some of the short in uh, Godardian video. And if you haven't seen them, for me, it's a uh, the besides the Histoire du Cinéma, it's it's absolute masterpieces. Uh, uh, don't miss that; it's uh, it's it's extraordinary. 
But I, I just want to add to, to, to this remark that um, one very important thing also is that Godard doesn't just follow and use uh, the technologies. Of course, there is these two uh, last films that are amazing, Tree Disaster and Adieu au Langage, that are critics, of course, of the use of the next technology, the last technologies. But also, there is no fatality. Because, for example, um, after he made the Histoire du Cinéma, that are the transfer from 35 millimeters to video and then to digital, then he made this film, the moment choisi des histoires du cinéma, uh, selected moments of the history of cinema, that was in 35 millimeters. Uh, so everything goes back to 35. And so it's like a stratigraphy, stratigraphy of textures, of plasticities, of uh, rhythm. And that was a lesson about what the cinema will, in a way, give to the history of uh, visual culture and art in, in, in general. Because you have like a, a pantheon, a compendium of all kind, the, the, the visuality, the plasticities uh, that were uh, created uh, to, as what you say, <laughs> Tout ce qui bouge, uh, all what is film, meaning image in motion. Uh, voilà, the mo selected moment of the history of cinema is uh, maybe the final point uh, mm -hmm. uh, for for this topic. Well, let me ask let me ask one more question here um, to us uh, before we turn it o over to the to you, um, or for for broader questions. One of the things that seems that that I'm I'm as we're talking is happening is that the focus say on on Lake Godard, uh begins around 1990 and moves to the present uh, with a, a special focus on Histoire du Cinema. Um, this is true for us. This is true for much of the work that's been written recently recently on on the late Godard. Um, and there's 20 years of filmmaking and video making in between 1968 and this new emergence in or re-emergence in the early, late 80s and early 90s um, through Histoire du Cinema. There are clearly continuities. Um, Godard begins making what he calls scenarios, um, short video works to accompany his feature films, Scénario du film Passion, Scénario du film Sauve qui peut, um, in which he begins to develop some of the techniques that later become center, central to his video work, especially, I think, superimposition. Um, and the role of superimposition as a video-based form of criticism, or video-based form of understanding the construction of images. But there are all, and there are other continuities, uh, issues about nature, for example, and the filming of nature, connected to his move to, away from Paris to Switzerland, or back to Switzerland, but also developing itself a, a set of iconographic associations um, and a set of characteristic images, waves coming into shore, clouds, um, windows onto vistas, sound as well. We get the same audio clip of gulls that emerges at the very latest by King Lear and that continues through his films. Well, I think there is one clip of that in uh, Film Socialisme. Um, but there are also, you know, and his work on television in the 1970s continues on to the present. So these, to speak of, of the films of the 1990s and 2000s and 2010s, is hard to do outside of thinking about their emergence in these earlier decades, in the late 60s, the 1970s, and the 1980s. So I'm curious, how do you, how do, how should we, how do we, how ought we to think about the movement between these periods of films, and why? I mean, why? Why do you think, as well, that the later films have had this attention, while there's still the sense of a period of wilderness in Godard's career uh, that he comes back to from? Well, I think one of the differences between um, Nicole's position and mine, I think, relates to the films of the Ziga Vertov period, because. Um, for me, it seems to me what the importance of the Ziga Vertov period films 
which was immediately, you know, post-68, when he was working mainly with Garin, is almost of a negative quality. It's basically detaching himself from the cinema, cinematic institution and apparatus and um, its methods of financing, its methods of, you know, uh, production, all of this, even its idea of authorship. And, and so Godard, there's a kind of self-annihilation going on in which Godard is saying, I'm not Godard, I'm Godard and Garin now. And I think, for me, the work starts to become really interesting and important again around the time of the first TV series that he did with Meville and Numero Deux. And also, uh, when he started, when he actually went back to a project that he started on with Garin, completed it with Meville, which is called ECAAIR, which to me is the most politically persuasive of all of his political, directly agitational films. Um, because I actually think that the difficulty for me is that what they set out to do is where they failed. In other words, because they didn't change, they were very important for film academics. And it would be sort of like to explain Godard on a blackboard. Von Dest was exactly what, you know, what they were looking for. And Peter Ballin even wrote an essay to prove that, you know, called Counter Cinema, in which he sort of puts out on a chart, you know, this is counter cinema and this is dominant cinema. And, you know, but I think in terms of actually changing political, people's political perceptions, at least I would argue, they did less than um, the really radical challenges of things like Numero Deux, which I think we're still we're still figuring out. Um, in fact, at the time, the Ziga Verto film, they were not screened. They were almost not shown. They, they, they will be shown uh, maybe 10 years later, first on British TV and then everywhere in the world. So, so it's well, you could see them at the time, though. I mean, at least I did. A few <laughs> other people. No, but other people did, too. It's just that they had very limited... Yeah. Distribution, but they showed, they, but they showed it even at the new, things like the New York Film Festival. They were, you know, it's just that they didn't have the kind of art house audience that the previous films had. Of course, they they, they didn't have that. No, one, one thing I'm, that I think must be said uh, for young people that is that this discussion we can give you the feeling that everything is perfect, it's smooth, there is only continuity in, in Godard's works, and uh, but in fact, this uh, generation, and especially Godard and Gorin, uh, there is also a deep wound, uh, really um, something a little traumatic for them, is that, of course, they were Maoist, uh, they were Marxist-Leninist and Maoist, and in France, uh, there was a, a French writer and uh, uh, historian Simon Lace, who came back from uh, China and explained publicly what really was the Cultural Revolution, uh, meaning a massacre, <laughs> and so um, and a tyranny, and one of the darkest uh, time for for the people of China. And um, during some decades, uh, in a way, Godard finds solution to. Apologize. Uh, no, the word is not apologize, but to expiate. Um, to, comment tu dis expiate en anglais? Um, expiate. C'est bien l'anglais. <laughs> to exp um, because, um, of course, uh, when you when you saw uh, the Cultural Revolution from from Paris, it's a it has a totally other meaning. It was a an emancipatory uh, politics. It was. Uh, there was some effectivity, they, they, they really changed the society. It was not only an ideal, it was true, uh, especially for um, women and young people, and they changed the, 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 the spirit of uh, collectivity, and they create uh, a new energy. So everything that was true, but then, when they realized collectively, not only Godard, but, but all the the Maoist, um, the French Maoists, and maybe European Maoists, when they realized what 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 it was really about, uh, they have to find total other uh, purposes, uh, other 
uh, way of uh, uniting, way of working, way of, uh, in a way, trying to criticize uh, society. And one of the ways Godard found um, was uh, to turn to mysticity. <laughs> and it was, hélas pour moi, and, and patient. And, um, the 80s were very interesting because in a way, it's the only classical period for Godard uh, when he was dealing with classical art, classical painting, and suddenly had uh, un surmoi artistic, super artistic ego. And then he made his auto-critics. Um, in a way, um, went back again uh, to politics with film socialism that was, in a way, the synthesis of all this uh, uh, negativity uh, after the Tsiga Vertov period. So there are a lot of problems uh, still uh, at, takes, at stake uh, in Godard's works, and they remain, they, they deserve to be, to be discussed yet. But, uh, of course, I will remain the last defender if there is one of the Ziga Vertov period because it was so innovative. Yeah, I, I guess, your, Dan, your question troubles me somehow. Um, I mean, it's, it's a question that I find troubling as a question because uh, I can't see why uh, a person would need to feel chained in what he would want to say or see now to what he had said or seen 40 years ago, you know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, why, why there would have to be some kind of reference to the past in one way or another. I mean, one is moving, one is continually moving. So there are these repetitive shots in, in his films, uh, film after film, of running water, moving water, uh, boats coming in from the water. Adieu au langage has this, ferry on the Lac Le Mans that keeps coming into the dock and never quite getting there. Um, you know, uh, th the sense of one's text somehow being not only engraved for the public, but to so engraved and so um, reified that it dominates one's present life, one's early text dominating one's present life so that one really wouldn't be able to think. I mean, he's now at a point where he's saying interior experience is forbidden, which is a kind of interesting idea. And he wouldn't have said that earlier. And I wonder um, you know, how that can be used to understand his growth at the moment. That the media we're living with are relentlessly exteriorizing everything. You know, I mean, just in the new film, we do see kind of cell phone use. So the idea of the selfie maybe as a kind of way of externalizing one's uh, feeling, and feeling and being at the moment. But it's all over the place. I mean, there's just no way to have an interior life anymore um, and, be, and be with the culture at the same time. I, I, I know I sound like I'm rambling. <laughs> no, I know I sound like I'm rambling. I mean, um, but that's, I mean, <laughs> as somebody once said to me in a restaurant after serving sour vanilla ice cream, uh, that is the effect. Uh, <laughs> it's an effect. I'm rambling because I'm trying to catch something of the Godard I keep meeting, uh, film after film, time after time. And I would want to know how he would react to this question. So I think he would say he was younger. It was a long time ago. I, th I think... Um don't I, you? I mean, am I yeah, missing? Yeah, but I, I don't think that was my point, um, to say that he locked himself in in the 70s. No, 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 but isn't your question coming from a point of view that stands outside of movement and growth? No. Oh. Um, so I, I think, for example, if you're talking about the absence of interiority and the declaration that interiority is now forbidden by contemporary media, one would want to connect that to a series of questions about interiors and exteriors, interior states and exterior performances that run through much of Godard's work. Not that they're the same, but that this is a set of concerns. So that when he has in passion, for example, when he asks models to perform in a certain way, 
that these are also questions about the relation of media forms and the, the representation and the exteriorization and the simulation of interior states. I think one, one thing to say, and then maybe we should just, so we have some time to do this, push it open into questions. We can't. It's just always good to have a fight clearly so people can, can, can root. I think we're having a fight, and it's great. There'll be no violence. I just think we're... Well, the thing I'd say is that um, w there are two things that I've always, that I've found when I eventually went back and over many years uh, haphazardly saw most of what Godard has made. I still don't think I've seen everything. I've, saw, I've seen a lot of it. Um, is that two things seem to stand out. One, that the films build off one, one another, that he sees the past as something live that he works with. Not that, he ever, not that it imprisons him, but, that not, but it also doesn't go away. And that he's very alive to the sense of his own films as being in his past, and that he works often against films, his own films, as well as the history of cinema. Again, he is, for himself, part of the history of cinema. The other thing is that of the, you know, if we might say, of the great filmmakers, Godard is, I think, almost unique Wells may be another one, but less so, in his refusal to make things and his inability to make things we would consider as masterpieces, perfect works of art. Um, so one says, one could say about Renoir's Rules of the Game, that's a perfect film. Um, probably not true, but the extent to which in, for, in a Godard film there is rare, I can think of maybe one or two films in which do not have 20 minutes in them that I find almost unwatchable. Um, two or three things I know about her, a film I think it maybe you know, is up there among his greatest films, has 20 minutes that are, I think, profoundly boring and uninteresting. The rest of the film is extraordinary, but Godard's speed of working and his way of adapting things means he's almost the great film, the great anti-masterpiece filmmaker, um, and that his films are continually working with the sense of open-endedness of sketches, sketches for something future. It's a record of a state of filmmaking and a set of ideas at a point, but no more than that. Yeah, I mean, I wish I'd written this down because I didn't know I was going to need it today, so I didn't bring it. But I, I read recently that he he was telling an interviewer from Cahiers du Cinema that he had learned from something in Sight and Sound that in one of his films he had done something. I, I found that very touching, not profound, touching because um, it spoke to the reality of the living presence of, a, of an art of an, of an artist who's engaged in the work he's doing. He's not standing outside of it and keeping a record of everything he's done, and he's not seeing the history of Godard the way we are. And he's not an academic, in short. And um, the academics, I mean, one of the things about that you you didn't really n nail, but you kind of alluded to. I mean, when you, earlier, Jonathan, when you were talking about people having trouble sometimes with Godard, there's been a tremendous. Uh, almost aggressive attack upon Godard in both positive and negative ways by the academic establishment. I mean, they really have attached themselves to his work. And I don't know that he attaches himself to his work in that way. That's Well, I think one thing that I would say what I think that endorses the point you're making is that when I interviewed Godard here in Toronto um, in the late 90s, I was amazed to discover, like for me, Alphaville is almost like the greatest one of the greatest critiques we have of what's known as German Expressionist cinema. And when I said that to him, he said, I realize it's that now, but I didn't realize that when I was making it. And what he wanted to do in Histoire de Cinema, when he alludes to, and he shows you sections of, uh, of Alphaville with superimpositions of shots from um, Destiny or, you know, Fritz Lang, is, uh, that he discovered that that's what he was doing, but he didn't know that's what he was doing at the time. Which is kind of amazing, because it's overt references. I mean, you know, it's in the dialogue, it's in the images, but it was instinctual rather than um, intellectual in terms of the way he was doing it. They were just, you know, like the first available images he had maybe in the back of his mind when he was working with these themes. But he was not consciously doing a critique but then he went back and said, hey, I was doing a critique, and so that's what he's trying to acknowledge in Histoire de Cinema, I think. 
at least the way he described it. I think, I mean, I think I, I'm, I, I'm going to exercise my privileges as moderator at the moment, <laughs> and um, and open. And I'm sure I'm sure at some point one of you will ask a question that will allow us to continue our fight. Um, please don't do so explicitly. Um, but we'd like at this point to open it up um, to the floor. I think you're supposed to wait until you get the microphone. Hi. Uh, yeah, that was a very informative panel. Um, in Godard's early films, Le Petit Soda and Le Carabinier, um, he's very critical of the France of the time and um, you know the, the French military, whether it's Algeria or this uh, made-up country. And in his uh, Fritz Lang documentary, um, I think it's called A Dinosaur and a Baby, he talked about the, um, the, the rigidity of the French censorship to get these visas, to get exploited in, in, in movie theaters, et cetera. Um, I'm just wondering, how would you guys con uh, contextualize Godard as a mid-century French political filmmaker? And do any of his late films engage with the same kind of censorship, whether it's by running length times or certain casting decisions? I'll go first, because I can do this in one sentence. <laughs> when I was your age, I used to ask questions like that. <laughs> and now I don't. Does that help at all? I mean, he was your age, a little older maybe, but, uh, and also, you know, he told um, Jean Collet early on that he saw a difference between his um, working process as instinctive or reflective. And you can see instinctive, reflective, continuing all the way along. I, I think a lot, maybe, of what you're pointing to was instinctive. I, I'm not sure he was being critical of French establishment so much as expressing hatred. I, I think I can, uh, let, let me see if I can say a couple things about that as well. I think two things you mentioned are, are actually really worth pulling out. Um, one is a matter of casting, and that casting has always been something that mattered to Godard, um, whether it was fantasies about who he'd like to cast in a particular role um, or the actuality of who he did cast in that role. Um, so the, the actress, for example, to go back to Murray's very first comment about um, Nouvelle Vague, the actress who plays Elena Tolato Favrini is also the same actress who's the central character in Tarkovsky's Nostalgia, um, right? These are, I think, her only two film credits, um, is these two films. Um, if somebody has a smartphone, I'm gonna be proved wrong in five <laughs> seconds. But that sense of using actors to create associations, national, political, um, and also film historical matters greatly. The point about the running time is, is also important, that for, for the feature films, Godard has usually stayed within the standard running time for American mid-century feature films. Um, they're rarely long films, they're rarely excessively short films in the features. But there, there's not, for example, you know, a three-hour feature film that Godard has made. Um, this matters, I think. Um, it matters for his sense of what his own cinema is in relation to the cinema that's come before. It matters for his sense of what cinema is in relation to television. Um, as for his sense of France, I think there is often a, an expression of deep hatred. Um, there's also a moment in Histoire du Cinema, I think it's, I think it's 3A, um, where he's, he talks about the moral corruption of France, or maybe it's, it's 4B, I think, actually. The moral, the moral corruption of France, its utter decadence, the, the impoverishment of its political system, and what a unique privilege it's been to live in such a society. <laughs> Um, are you David Davidson? Yeah. Hey. <laughs> Hello. Um, I'm asking that um, because uh, of my answer. Um, first, I think your question is very useful because it reminds us that uh, Godard came from the from the right. I mean, he, all his family was from the right, colonialist, and so on. And he learned politics through censorship, because he was censored uh, for La, la Femme Mariée and, of course, Le Petit Soldat. And the one, the, depu the French deputy, who uh, censored him for the title of 
la femme mariée, ou at the beginning was uh, la femme mariée, the uh, married woman, and at the end was une femme mariée, a married woman, meaning uh, the married woman is not uh, is faithful to her husband. Well, it's a stupid moralistic uh, <laughs> debate. Anyway, this French deputy was uh, Jean-Marie Le Pen. He was the one who asked uh, to censor the Godard title. And our future, future president in France will probably be Marine Le Pen, uh, who is all, uh, as fascist as her father, but who didn't torture in Algeria. <laughs> Because she was too young, otherwise. <laughs> but, well, she was not born. But um, we, we are laughing, but we will not laugh. We will be refugees very soon in uh, Canada. <laughs> so um, it's very important to, to remember that uh, Jacques Rivette also was censored for La Religieuse and so on. So this generation who was petit bourgeois, who was wealthy, who has no problem, Uh, who was from the right, like Eric Romer and so on, uh, they learned politics through censor uh, upon the art. So it's very, very uh, significant. And then, of course, uh, all his life is uh, the, 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 learn, the l'apprentissage, uh, uh, the conquest of uh, liberty. And now, of course, since years, there is no more this kind of censorship in, uh, in France. But uh, it's, of course, more more terrible for filmmakers be because the censorship is an economic censorship. And the first one, and that's why I, I asked your name and wanted to be sure about it, the first one who really think about it was René Vautier, uh, who was the one of the most censored filmmakers in France. He made a big competition with Armand Gatti, who is a French anarchist filmmaker, to <laughs> win the award of the most censored French filmmakers, <laughs> but Armand Gatti won because he was censored in many countries, not only in France. <laughs> but René Routier was the first to uh, really think deeply uh, this phenomenon of uh, economical censorship. Um, and René Routier, he was, for example, he made this magnificent gesture to make a hunger strike to liberate a film that he has not made himself, but was the f a film by Jacques Panigel, who was a teacher of mathematics, who made a film about uh, the way the French police uh, made a massacre in uh, 1962, in October. And um, so now, what, go what Godard is making is, of course, not uh, trying to defy the political censorship, because uh, when waiting for Marine Le Pen, that, that's, <laughs> that's not a problem. But all what he's making, building a studio in Hall, uh, making exercise films, um, of course also sometimes fooling uh, all the people who may order him films, like Darty, of course, or all the people that uh, order him advertisements, And each time, of course, he find ways to subvert uh, this order and make poetry. Um, well, all, the, all this is to uh, find ways to build another economy that can be totally autonomous. And uh, that's a very, very useful example for every, everyone now. Let's move on to the next. Thanks. So. I think one thing that the late Godard inherited from the early Godard is a question of, of love. So from Le Mépris, for example, to, to in praise of love. So, and for Godard, love, I think for late Godard, love is a true connection between people, which is almost, by the way, in his films, a heterosexual couple takes that form. So, and a true connection, and maybe also a longing for Yeah, a time before language, to refer to the latest film, in which people were still able to transfer their, well, inner experience. You were talking about that. So, and then this question about love, as I see it, is also a question. Uh, uh, this longing for love is also longing for grace. And I mean, it is in a, maybe in a secular sense, but still. Because a lot of his films, his later films, they refer, they employ Catholic vocabulary. So with Passion, Hail Mary, The Paradise in um, Nouvelle Vague, um, and Adieu au langage, where he also plays on that, yeah, 
on, on God and the title. So I was wondering if you could say something about Godard's employment of this yeah, reli religious vocabulary in a secular way. Well, for, first we can say that during the 60s, of course, love, uh, you know, totally human, terrestrial, profane uh, meaning was one of the main uh, uh, questions in his films. And one of the most uh, original way he found to treat that, uh, to deal with that, is the caress, uh, especially in precisely La Femme Marie. It was a very beautiful film about uh, to touch people. And um, we were discussing that with Murray just before the table ronde. Uh, in a way, tactility, uh, apticity uh, is still dealt with in 3D, in the way he wants 3D to function, uh, meaning exactly the contrary of the blockbusters uh, who are using 3D to be super aggressive and uh, a bit like Eisenstein, I mean, to, <laughs> to penetrate to your brain through your eyes by uh, uh, really giving you uh, wants. Um, but in the meantime, between this very tactile uh, period, the 60s and the uh, the contemporary, the actual uh, period, there is indeed the mystical one. <laughs> and, and there, one of the, well, during this time, one of the things that was the most uh, um, obsess obsessive in his work is uh, Saint Paul. Saint Paul in his way to Damas and have his, having a revelation uh, about what an image can say, can about what is representation, what is the figurable and unfigurable. Sorry, I don't know the English word, but everyone can understand. I think what what, what can be figured and what can't be figured, what is visible and invisible, and I think his way to deal uh, with this um, this um, question of love was. In a way, were well, in a way very monumental, uh, very referred to the most antique uh, conception of representation, the one that you can read in into in Plin, Plinus, uh, Plin l'Ancien, uh, Plinus, Pliny the Elder. Uh, so that that was the very classical uh, way to consider uh, the powers of uh, representation. The figurable and unfigurable, so wh what you can fig represent and what you cannot represent, and that is, of course, God, uh, the Almighty, uh, and so on. So that, that's why, uh, just before I was talking about his uh, classical period uh, in this sense, because uh, all what is love, passion, resurrection, infigurability uh, refers to this uh, very antique uh, question and are, in a way, a reactualization and also a way to make the cinema, make cinema the hair of these uh, problematics. That's just one answer, and now the others. Well, there, there, there's a um, relationship between the church and um, religiosity. They aren't the same. And, um, you know, wonderful moment in film socialism where we on the ship, there's, a, there's a, suddenly a priest giving a mass, and all of these tourists have stopped drinking at the bar. They're using the bar as a church because that's the space they have available. And then um, much later in the film, there's a very religious moment, or a, mo a moment of deep felt passion, which I think brings me back anyway to Passion, where this little boy, I guess he's about 10, um, is conducting a foray, I think. Uh, there's somebody playing a record off camera, and he's got a stick that he's using as a baton, and he's not very good as a conductor, but good enough to make you see that he's just really into that music. Then later he's watching TV with his parents, and there's some music on the TV, and he starts conducting it with his hand. Then later he's got a paintbrush, and he's painting a canvas, and when they insist on letting, letting getting him to let them see the canvas, it turns out he's, I think he's painting a Renoir, but literally, he's got a Renoir and he's painting it, he's painting over it. I mean, this, uh, you know, this devotion, this deep devotion, which we also saw in Passion, the recreation of the, of the great works of art, the devotion to uh, the art that's gone by before, but with the spirit of the present, is deeply religious. So 
uh, religiosity um, and the church are fragments now in our culture. I mean, they're they're no longer occupying the position they occupied in the Middle Ages. So he's he's showing uh, all of the fragments of our culture, and this is one of them. So you wouldn't want to dispense with it, but on the other hand, it mustn't it mustn't t take too solid a form. I don't know if that addresses your question, but that's how I see it. Uh, yes, I think that this is Godard is caught between the tendencies of both um, a, d a desire for a kind of blasphemy and a taking it very seriously at the same time. Um, both impulses seem operative, that there's a, um, a not parody of, but a reworking of that's at the one, one time critical and another time reverential with respect to the spiritual. Um, it does, it seems, I think this is one of the hardest questions to deal with in respect to Godard and the late films, what, to, what role to accord religious or theological pronouncements, um, what status to give them. One important thing to remember, which thing to, to remember this, which Nicole brought up, um, is that for Godard, theology, as with just about anything he talks about, winds up doubling back onto the cinema. And so love, in particular forms of coupling, um, caressing and touching, also comes to be related to the activity of montage, of joining together, of testing, of seeing whether something works correctly or not. Um, and that it becomes, especially in a film like Eloge de l'Amour, one of his models for his own practice. Um, a spiritual love, different kind of touching. You find that in the, mo in the moment in Histoire de Cinema 1A, the famous moment of Giotto's Noli di Tangere, um, juxtaposed to, m match to Elizabeth Taylor reaching down to Montgomery Cliff, but also the secular. Uh, that runs through. Both come to be forms of engagement between elements of film fragments. Um, unfortunately, and I say this with, with a deep sense of unfortunateness, um, as with Godard's films, um, the ideas, this, the, as with Godard's film, this, this discussion contains ideas that outrun its time frame. But the time frame has come to an end. We are within the, the purview of the feature film, um, the feature film time limit. Um, but I want to, to initially thank our panelists um, for their contributions to the discussion, and also thank you for being here and contributing to it as well. <laughs>